Christian or non-Christian, life is short and life is full of challenges. Now, how are we going to live our lives in view of that concept? That's a fundamental passage of life. Life is short and life has its challenges. Now, in your knowledge, just general knowledge of the book of Job and the study of this man and the circumstances that he faced, let me suggest to you this morning by way of introduction again, this man was not a bad man. As a matter of fact, he in his day was probably one of the most spiritually minded and righteous walking people on the planet in his day. The concept of Job is, verses 1, 2, and 3, what I call a priority list of this man's life. But well, we all have to have our priorities right. And if you'll notice in verse 1, it doesn't talk about his family. In verse 1, it doesn't talk about what his possessions were or what his material wealth was, though he had it. It talks about he and God. It says, verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz, his name was Job. By the way, the Hebrew word Job is Job. J is a Y in Hebrew. And that Hebrew word literally means good, G-O-O-D good so anywhere you find in your Old Testament the word good more than likely it is the word Job okay so when he was born his parents named him good you would expect good to receive good but what we're going to find here as you well know and as I know from a study of this man this man suffered tremendously and we are allowed in the first two chapters to see behind what you and I can't see with our physical eye. We're allowed to see in the spiritual realm. Because all of what happened to Job is literally explained in the first two chapters. Now, when you get to chapters 3, etc., all the way down until God speaks to Job in chapters 38 to 42, Job is going to ask the why questions. A lot of them. Chapter 3, wherefore. Okay? And that's, there's nothing wrong with asking the why questions when you don't have an answer. As a matter of fact, how many of you have ever heard, well, I'm going to ask you a stupid question. Listen, there's no stupid questions when it comes to Bible questions. Though we were all ignorant at one time in our knowledge of the Bible all the way through time. Maybe we have know more now. Hopefully we'll know more as time goes on. But righteous people ask why questions. I've done all kinds of funerals in my lifetime as a preacher. I've done it from infants that live three days to automobile accidents of teenagers to cancer patients of youth to people that were the best and the brightest in a community that their families needed them, their communities needed them, their church family needed them, and they died early in life, in the prime of their life. And people said, why would God allow that person? Why not take this person out here that we read in the newspaper or they post it in the, in the uh, post office, you know, wanted, criminal, sorry. Why not this person instead of this person? Well, man that is born of woman is a few days. Okay? Whether it's righteous or unrighteous, man that is born of woman is a few days. By the way, if you live to be 150 that's still a few days compared to 969, right? Okay. And by the way, if you live to be 1,000 to break the record, to beat Methuselah, 1,000 compared to eternity, still a few days. By the way, to God, one day. This is 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is one day. 2 Peter 3, 8. So the picture here is, what can I learn fundamentally about Job and human suffering? First of all, let's get our priorities right. Before Job ever suffered, here's what it says. Not just that his name was Job, he was a perfect and an upright man, one that feared God. And King James says, and eschewed or shunned evil, other translations. The idea is, he was a man that always wanted to do the right thing, and he always tried not to do the wrong thing. That doesn't mean he's sinless. You read the book of Job and find that. He's going to repent at the end of the book. But the point is, he feared God. 
me ask you a question. Do you think this country of ours needs a big dose of fearing God? Being God-fearing people. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 1 and verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Well, by the way, Job's on his way to knowledge because he fears God. The Bible says that. As a matter of fact, this is what God says about him. When you go on down in the book of Job chapter 1, when Satan is speaking to God with reference to where have you been, basically, the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. A perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and shuns evil. If God calls you his servant, are you his servant? You ever had anybody call you a name? Or call you something you're not? By the way, it doesn't make it so, does it? But if God calls you a servant, are you a servant? Okay. So we have two references in the first chapter. In the first chapter of Job. We have basically the biographical information at the beginning, and we have God's own statement to Satan. Here is an example of a servant of mine down here. Okay? Now, in chapter 1, verse 1, we find his spirituality. In chapter 1, verse 2, we find his family. Okay? It says, There was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. By the way, uh, he had a wife. You do know that, right? We call her Sister Job because we don't know what her name really was. She had a name. But the point is, he has these ten children through this wife. By the way, this wife, when you get to the end of the book of Job, she's still around. Now, she struggled. By the way, she lost all ten kids too, folks. She lost her husband who thought he was terminal with what he had. Matter of fact, she basically tells him, as far as success is concerned, just curse God and die. And Job turns on his wife and says, you speak like the foolish women speak. In other words, that's the way the women of the world out here speak. We don't go down that road regardless of how much we're going to have to suffer. We don't know why, but we're not going to go there. Why? Because he fears God and shuns evil. Okay? Now, verse 3 tells us what financially he's worth. Okay? Now, I don't know out here in West Oklahoma, cattle, camels, she-asses, you know, sheep, whatever the case might be. I would imagine cattle probably has some value out here. I think in Texas and this part of the country, by the fact, it does in Alabama. But the concept is, what is this man literally worth? Notice, his substance, we would say his wealth, 7,000 sheep. Can I look at a hillside out here in western Oklahoma and picture 7,000 sheep on that hillside? We have a mission work in New Zealand. And I've been over there one time on the North Island. And I'm told there's more sheep in that country than there are people. And we're driving from city to city in the, the rural section of that country. And I looked up on a hillside, and it just looked like this was just white, like cotton. And that's just sheep on this green hillside as far as you could see. And I thought, well, I don't know how many that is, but that's a lot of sheep on the hill. I want you to think 7,000. It's 7,000 sheep. That's not all he's got. The rest of this verse says, and 3,000 camels. This is in 300, folks. This is in the thousands he's talking about. Then he's got 500 yoke of oxen. By the way, that makes 1,000, right? Because 500 yoke is pairs. That's 1,000. So we're still in the thousands here. Okay, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and this is in a very great household. Household carried with the idea of servants. By the way, if you got all of that to tend to, are you going to need help? Though I don't care if you got a wife and ten kids. Look at what a wife and ten kids and a husband got to deal with if he doesn't have help. By the way, would you call this a big rancher out here in western Oklahoma? Okay. Would he be well known in western Oklahoma with this kind of figures? Would everybody know who he is? 
By the way, they all knew who he was. As a matter of fact, he sat in the gate of the city of Uz. So this man is very important. When you go to chapter 29, and I'm not going to go to chapter 29 this, in this class for lack of time, but this is the man that people came for advice. Okay? Now, let's go back to verses 1, 2, and 3. Verse 1 is Job and God. Verse 2 is Job and his family. Verse 3 is Job and his possessions. Now listen very carefully. Those verses are not put in the Bible by accident. Not in that arrangement. You know, if anybody walks up to me and have never met me, most of you have never met me till right now, till today. Literally, you know very little about me. And for that, to be honest with you, very little do I know about you. Okay? There's all kinds of pieces of information we could share with one another, and we might not put it in a priority list. But this is in a priority list. Listen, you take away Job's possessions, he's still got his family, and he's still got God. You take away his family, and he's still got God. Now you take away his God, and now you've got Job. But here's the one thing you'll learn about Job, and this is a fundamental about your life and my life. Take away everything I've got in this world and in this life. You can't take my God away from me. Do you know why? I will not let you. See, I'm not converted to you. I'm converted to God. And that is the fundamental point of the first chapter of Job. The reason he didn't crack, the reason he didn't crumble when it looked like his whole world is coming down, he still had God. And that's all that mattered. Come on, shake or nod. You're probably going to hear me say that a thousand times this week. Is that not fundamentally true of the Christian life? So number one, he fears God and he shuns evil. Number two, his family is important. By the way, your family is important to you. And number three, your possessions are important to you because it has to do with your livelihood and basically the ability to continue financially, socially, etc., to function as you do. But take away my possessions, even take away my heritage, my children, I'll still live for God. How many of you have ever lost a child to death in this room? Raise your hand. God bless you. I've never lost a child to death. I've lost parents, in-laws, aunts, uncles, cousins, etc., like a lot of folks in this life. But we have a couple at home where I preach who had one son, one child, and uh, the husband of this family, the dad, told me after they had come back to the services of the church, because they'd been away for a long time, he says, we sunk our entire life in our son. Everything about our world was in our son. And then our son died early in life, in the prime of his life. He says, and it literally took everything out of us. We quit going to church. We quit socializing, so to speak. Basically, we just stayed at home and sort of caved in. He says, in some senses, we blame God for that. Look, what, what were we doing wrong that he would die? Our whole life is in this boy. And he told me after living basically that kind of life, having lost that only child, that one day they sort of sat around and they looked, and it's Sunday, you know, what do you do on Sunday? What did they used to do on Sunday when their son was alive? Well, they went to services. Went with their son. But it's painful. And sitting there week after week after week after week and Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, he, he said, you know, we're not helping ourselves by doing this. And by the way, God's still God. Whether we go to church or don't go to church. So finally, they made that tough decision to get up that Sunday and to go to services. And as we say, 
get through it, right? Get through the service. And they went back the next week, and it got easier as time went on. But this gentleman basically told me, we literally, when we lost our son to death, gave up on life. Oh, we're physically alive, but we were just existing. You think the book of Job could say anything to this couple? As a matter of fact, now they would say, we were making the biggest mistake of our life by quitting God. As a matter of fact, our strength was in God. And we didn't use that. We didn't turn to that. You know, Nehemiah 8 and 10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Memorize that, Nehemiah 8, 10. So the concept is, is that Job's strength? The joy of the Lord? All right, so let's move a little further. We're not gonna get through, obviously. In chapter one, the, she, the scene shifts from earth to heaven. By the way, every time one of Job's 10 children has a birthday, they have a party. And as soon as the party is over, Job goes and offers sacrifices should they have offended God with their lips. So as the patriarch of his family, under patriarchal law, he's offering blood sacrifices for the sins of his children so that they'll be right with God. Okay? Scene shifts in heaven. Have you considered my servant Job? Satan says in chapter 1, verse 9, does Job fear God for nothing? Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan knows one particular thing about humanity in general, but he makes a logical fallacy here. What he thinks is true of all of humanity, he thinks is also true of Job. That's not true of Job, and God knew that. But it is true, as a general term, that there are people who will serve God only for what God gives them. You keep giving me, I'll keep serving. You take it from me, I'll cut you off. Satan knows humanity operates that way. In the earthly ministry of Jesus, when Jesus was feeding the bellies of these people with the loaves and the fish, did they follow him everywhere? And when he didn't feed them, with the loaves and the fish, but fed their soul with the bread of heaven, did they cut him off in a heartbeat? Does this congregation have anybody passing through that wants the church to help them in a benevolent way? By the way, you see idiot right here on my forehead? Okay, person comes through, I had an individual one time leaving Florida headed to Texas by way of North Alabama. North Alabama, by the way, not just Alabama. And I said, you know, I-10 from Florida can get you to Texas a lot quicker than coming all the way up here, almost to the Tennessee state line. How in the world are you going to Texas from Florida coming by up here? Well, I'm, well, I'm just up this way. I've got to have help this way, okay? We have helped people that probably did not deserve it. As a matter of fact, they were just big cons. By the way, if you pull a station wagon full of a bunch of kids in there that are half clothed and starving to death, I'll fill the pantry, I'll take the pantry of the church and fill that car up. I'm a sucker for kids. Okay? But I've seen people with rings on their fingers, they could go to a pawn shop and hot one of them and provide anything they needed for a trip to go anywhere in this country. But no. We're going to stop here at this church building and we're going to beg for what we need. We're going to buy what we want. We're going to beg for what we need. Okay. Well, we're having services here on Wednesday night. If you'll stay for services, after services, the deacon in charge of benevolence will basically look at your case and we will probably help you if you'll stay. Gone. Out of here. I only wanted what came out of your pantry or fill my gas can or find me a place to stay for the night. I have no intention of staying for your Bible class. Is that the world in western Oklahoma just like it is in northern Alabama? 
So where's the priority list here? What do we know of humanity as a whole when it comes to spiritual things? If you will provide me food, clothing, shelter, etc., I'm all about your people. But if you're trying to deal specifically with my soul and not provide for me anything physically, I'm out of here. And Satan knows that. There are people on this planet who will serve and at least sem seemingly serve God simply for what God gives them. You take it away, he'll curse you to your face. That is the argument of Job chapter 1 that Satan made about humanity as a whole. Now I ask you the question. Go look at yourself in the mirror and ask you that person in the mirror. Just you in the mirror now. You and your reflection. Do I serve God in this church or wherever you attend? Do I serve God because of what God gives me? If God took away everything I physically have, would I still come to church? Would I still be a faithful, strong member of this congregation? Come on, shake or not. Would you do that? And I know you don't have that taken away from you. I don't. But the question is, Satan probably has asked God for us. You do know God, Satan asked the Lord in heaven for Peter. He asked for Job. He asked for Peter. I don't have any doubt he's asked for me. Look, Satan's already got the world. You know who Satan wants? He wants the church is what he wants. He wants us. We're the target. And he will use any means of persuasion that he possibly can to break us. And human suffering has caused a lot of people to quit God. A lot of people. This is a fundamental thing to contemplate. Listen, you may have got up with arthritis. Y'all know who Arthur is? I get up with Arthur every day. There is not a day in my life I'm not in pain. Not a day. But I have learned to get used to it. It's the new normal. How, how many of y'all know what the new normal means? Okay? But the bottom line is, you can wallow in self-pity, okay, and, and throw a pity party so that everybody will pity you and make the world miserable and make yourself miserable in the same process. Job's not that way. Okay? God basically says in chapter 1, you can take what he has, but you can't touch Job. You can't touch Job. By the way, that shows that the wild bulldog is still on the leash. He is not in absolute control of this planet. God is. And God only lets him do what he lets him do. Remember that. That's fundamental. So now we come to chapter 2. Job does not sin with his lips. Satan again, as it were, is before the throne of God. And the question is, have you considered my servant Job? None like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and shuns evil. And still he does retain his integrity, though thou hast moved me against him. And Satan says, skin for skin, all will a man give for his life. So you didn't let me touch him. How many of you know what torture is? Torture. In the state of Alabama, there was a gentleman who was a POW in Vietnam. His name is Jeremiah Denton. He was a senator. Jeremiah Denton was put on a television camera in Vietnam. He was in the Hanoi area. And he was being asked these questions and basically supposed to be giving the answers the North Vietnamese warned him to to give, basically it's propaganda, and this was broadcast to the American military. Jeremiah Denton was blinking his eyes. He had bright lights on him, but he was blinking his eyes. And as he was blinking his eyes, there was an individual there, the military, who was watching him. And he said, that's not normal to be blinking the way he's blinking. Let's, let's look at his eyes. And what he was doing was Morse code. T-O-R-T-U-R-E. T-O-R-T-U-R-E. That's literally what he was blinking with his eyes in Morse code. And immediately, the gentleman recognized that, and he says, 
He is saying torture. All of what's coming out of his mouth is being given based upon the fact they are torturing these people. By the way, when he was released and came back and they debriefed him, he said, I'm glad you folks understood what I was trying to tell you without what was coming out of my mouth. Yes, all of that was going on. God says, I know, I know enough about this man to know. All right, you can take, you can touch his life, but you cannot take his life. By the way, is that torture? I have been to hospital intensive care units of people who the doctors have told the family we've done all we can do. I heard a doctor tell me that about my own dad. We've done all we can do. It's just a matter of time. We'll try to keep him comfortable. I heard hospice tell that to me with reference to my mother when she's dying at home. Look, it's not pleasant to watch someone die. Job thinks he's going to die. Job says in Job 14, though he slay me, yet while I trust in him, I'm still not going to curse God. Though it looks like he's going to let me die. Matter of fact, Job asked God to take his hand away from him so he will die. But he wants to know why before he dies. That's the bulk of these questions through here. All right? Take your health from you. How many of you are familiar with a man by the name of Don Blackwell? Don Blackwell is the director of GBN out of, Nat out of Memphis. Brother Don Blackwell was holding a gospel meeting in Virginia of a good friend of mine, the, uh, the Gibbs, and he was on a four-wheeler accident, he and his wife, and literally he's paralyzed. And he's in a specialized wheelchair right now. He's still doing work, by the way, but he made the comment after that severe accident. Matter of fact, they thought he was going to die in the hospital in Virginia. Didn't know what was going to happen as far as his life was concerned. But I heard him speak after the accident one time in North Alabama, and he was talking about how that he continually asked God, what am I going to do? What do you mean by all this? And one particular lesson he gave, he talked about how that it was, get this, a blessing that he received in life through this accident. He said, at first... I was reading all the websites on paraplegics and quadriplegics and all of their comments in those threads and all these people are wanting to die. They're, they're studying ways to commit suicide. They're studying ways to help doctors and family members help them to die. They don't want to live the rest of their lives in that, in that state. He said, I was reading all that. He said, I'm going to tell you, as a preacher, some of that made sense, even though I'm a preacher. And know that this life is temporary and eternity is what you live for. He said, but when you are literally in that situation, you ask the why questions. If you ever hear Brother Don Blackwell preach now, he's a better preacher now than he was before the accident. You know why? Because he was made of the right stuff. And he made up his mind, when life gives you lemons, what do you do with it? You make lemonade out of it. You make the best that you possibly can out of it. If you're laying horizontal in a nursing home, bloom where you're planted. You hear me? Because there's probably someone in another room probably worse than you are. Look, go to an NICU, Neurological Intensive Care Unit, and you think you've got arthritis from neck bone to tailbone? you'll be thankful you're walking out of that hospital after you visited that person in that unit. I don't feel so bad now. You know, life has its way of creating perspectives, right? If you'll let it. If you'll let it. And here's Job at the ash heap, scraping himself. He talks about when it's night, he prays for the dawn. And when the dawn comes, he prays for it to come night. In other words, there is no relief 24 hours in pain. 
And he has three friends to show up. So now let's talk about these gentlemen. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. How many of y'all got any one of these three friends as your friend circle? If you do, bless your heart, as we say in the South. Because with friends like this, you don't need enemies. How many of you have ever had anybody ask you, what's, what's going on with you? What, what's, why are you sick? And then you tell them, and I said, I had an aunt that had that. She didn't live two weeks. That's a friend you need, right? Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar show up. By the way, Eliphaz is a Temanite. Temanite. Teman is a descendant of Esau. So it is my conviction that while Jacob and Joseph were the greatest men of the West in Egypt at the end of the book of Genesis, Job is the greatest man in the East. So Job, in my chronological estimation, fits toward the end of the book of Genesis. Genesis is a book about the family of Abraham as they ultimately migrate to the west, end up in Egypt. And ultimately, Exodus brings them out and comes back to the, what we again call the Middle East. Job is from the east. He is the greatest man of the east, while Jacob and Joseph are the greatest men of the west. Okay? Because they're all living under patriarchal age. All of them. Okay? But the point is, here are three gentlemen who come, they hear of Job's plight, and they come to Job, and they all have three different arguments. Okay? How many of you have ever tried to help somebody in a funeral home visitation? When my dad died, and we had a long line, like three-hour visitation line with people coming through to, to say, I heard all kinds of advice. Y'all even know what I'm talking about. I've had advice like, you'll never get over it. Literally, I had a person say, you'll, you'll never get over it. Your life will be different. Well, I knew that. I knew my life would be different. And then I had the person who basically turned and said, it says, time will heal all wounds. Now, how do you take both sets of advice? You'll never get over it. And time will heal all wounds. And by the way, and everything in between. I know they meant well. Listen, when someone is sick or someone's in a visitation long, don't tell them, I know how you're feeling. My wife's here. If I were to walk up to a gentleman who just lost his wife and I said, I know what you're going through, that is not true. Because personally, I don't know what he's going through. Now, if it's a parent, I understand what you're feeling. I've, I've been there. I've been in your shoes. By the way, that's called sympathy in Scripture. Sympathy. Eliphaz's argument, very quickly since I heard the bell, or buzzer, whatever that sound is. Turn to Job 4 and verse 8. Here's Eliphaz's statement to Job when he asks all these why questions in chapter 3. Here's his basic argument. Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Underline, if you do in your Bible, even as I have seen. Because that's Eliphaz's basic argument all the way through the book of Job. How many of you have ever made an argument based on your own personal experiences? Now, my experience has been that if you eat that, you're going to get sick. My experience has been, if you go there, you're not going to enjoy that place. My experience. By the way, sometimes people will eat what you don't like, and they'll enjoy it. Because their personal experience is totally different from yours. But Eliphaz's argument is, as I've seen, my personal experience has been, Job, no one has ever suffered the way you're suffering without being wicked. No one. By the way, he's never met Jesus Christ either, right? And that man's sinless hanging on that cross dying. Eliphaz would say, as I have seen, no one's ever hung on a cross and wasn't up there for a good reason. Well, you need to back up on that statement. Because personal experience is good just to a point, but it don't teach everything. It don't teach everything. By the way, personal experiences are good educators, but they're not infallible educators. 
That's why you have the Bible. This is infallible. Go to the next guy, Bildad, chapter 8, verse 8. Here's Bildad's argument. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to the search of their fathers. Now, Bildad's argument is past history. Past history. And by the way, past history or history is a good educator. Okay, But again, it's not a perfect educator because past history... By the way, who writes the history books? The losers? The winners write the history books. And by the way, can they be biased in their view of history as they write it? Okay. Now, history or past history is the personal experiences of past that's put down in print. And so Bildad says, well, I'm not just talking about my personal history. I'm talking about we've studied the past. We've gone as far back in the past as we possibly can go. Look, having this book right here from Genesis to Revelation, how much past history do we have that Bildad didn't have? Bildad's living under the patriarchal age. He's not living under the mosaical age or the Christian dispensation. We have more history now than Bildad ever dreamed of having. Of course, we put Jesus Christ in here and say, well, let's talk about past history. Here is a sinless man who died on a cross. There's human suffering on a large scale. And what, what's your view on him? Has he done something wrong that he's suffering like that? Oh, he hasn't done anything wrong. Okay. Turn to chapter 20 of Job and verse 1. Here's Zophar's argument. 20 verse 1. Then answered Zophar the name of Thide and said, verse 2, Therefore do my thoughts cause me to answer, for this I will make haste. Okay, so what we have here is his private opinion. Private opinion. So here are these, here's the three arguments of these three gentlemen. Personal experiences, past history, and private opinion. By the way, how many of you folks in here have an opinion about any subject that I could bring up? Y'all ever talk to anybody about a particular subject and all of a sudden this person just spilled all they knew about it? Look, get on an airplane... Fly by yourself, sitting next to someone for three hours cross country, and you got a captive audience. By the way, you're the captive audience. Because as soon as they say something about something, and then you comment about it, and then they expound for about two and a half hours, and you want to go anywhere to get off that plane. Because everybody's got an opinion. Everybody in this room's got an opinion. Everybody out here on these streets got an opinion about everything. Politics, football, you name it. By the way, politics could be football. Football could be politics, right? The weather. Church. Health. You name it. Okay? The bottom line is, the answer to human suffering in the book of Job is God made a better man out of this man through suffering. He was good in chapter 1. He is great in chapter 42. You want to go from good to great? You want to go from good to great? Don't give up on what God's trying to make out of you, born of woman, in a few days and full of trouble. Don't give up on what God's trying to make you. Listen, suffering is not all bad. Suffering will either make you or break you. It's your choice. It's my choice. And that, to me, is what this book's about. It's fundamental to deal with whatever problem comes our way. Thank you for your attention. It's about 15 after. We'll take a break.